get started here. Um, we will continue to have everyone else join. Um, my name is Tia Hansen. I am here with the SADS Foundation. I'm family support and a long QT patient as well. We are so excited for this. This is going to be such a fun perspective from our community. So tonight we're going to be talking about living with SADS, continue with our series and exercise and sports participation from the patient perspective. And while we have a few minutes still with everyone joining, I just want to talk about just very briefly um, about the exercise movement program that we are starting that will start in two days, actually. So check your emails and sign up for it, participate. It's supposed to be fun. And we would love to have everyone's participation in that if possible. And please let us know if you have any questions. Uh, as a reminder, please keep microphones muted. Cameras are optional. Following our moderated conversation, we will have time for some questions. You may type your question in during the chat. And we wanna thank our patient panelists that are here. They're volunteering their time from all over the world, actually. We have Mark here who is from Ireland and staying up very late for this. So we're so great. So he has been having some problems with her bandwidth a little bit. So I'll go ahead and take over for Tia while she works out that issue with her technology. Um, trying to remember exactly where she left off but so we're going to have our moderated conversation um and then they'll have time for questions so i'm going to go ahead and introduce our panelists so our first panelist is jason and jason has arvc he is from west newberry massachusetts he's married and has an eight-year-old son his diagnosis of AR arvc happened in the summer of 2020 he currently works as a civilian engineering technician for the US Navy. Hobbies now include hiking, sailing, camping, and being outside with family. Being outside is his therapy. Prior to diagnosis with ARVC, he ran and trained for all types of races ranging from 5K to 50K. Thanks for joining us tonight, Jason. Um, our next panelist is Charlie, and Charlie has long QT type one. He grew up in Duluth with a family loving the outdoors, cross-country skiing, biking, and swimming in Lake Superior. He's fortunately lived an asymptomatic life and was just diagnosed three years ago. He works as a mental health professional working with and through anxiety that can be associated with long QT syndrome. And next we have Mark, and Mark has Brugada. Mark has been living his life to the fullest despite his diagnosis. And that includes the incredible feat of completing an Ironman, which is a triathlon that consists of a 2.4 mile swim and a 112 mile bicycle ride and a 26.22 mile run, which is a total of 140.6 miles. And he's joining us from Ireland despite the time difference. Um, our next panelist is Suzanne, and her son has CPVT. He was going to be joining us tonight, but unfortunately, he is not feeling well. So Suzanne will be um, speaking for both of them and um, giving us Kian's responses to the questions. Um, Suzanne lives in a suburb of Houston, Texas, and loves being with her family. She has a Bachelor's of Science degree in Health and an Associate of Applied Sciences degree in Nuclear Medicine. She worked as a Nuclear Medicine Technologist for 13 and a half years and is currently a part-time instructor at Galveston College for the Nuclear Medicine Technology Program. She is a member of the SADS CPVT Steering Committee and a member of the SADS Board of Trustees. 
Kian, her son, is seventeen year is a seventeen year old junior at Clear Springs High School. He is an avid Texas Aggies, Houston Astros, and Houston Texans fan. He loves anything sports related and loves to spend time watching his favorite teams play and play on the Xbox. He also enjoys spending time outdoors with his friends, throwing the football around. Kian was diagnosed with CPVT when he was 13 year old, 13 years old. And Kian is amazing. I've gotten a chance to meet him in person and talk with him over the years. And he's just an amazing young man. So, uh, Tia, it looks like your camera is working now, so I'll go ahead and turn it back over to you. Yes, my apologies, everyone. That was so strange. Uh, but it looks like everyone has had a chance to hear about our awesome panelists. Uh, and we have some questions that we would love to ask. And the first question uh, Charlie, do you care if I ask you the first question and then you guys can just jump around, take turns? Yeah, that's great. Okay. What is your history with sports and exercise? Yeah, so is when I um, was in my mid to late 20s, um, I got into cross-country skiing and I was doing uh, um, the American Berkebiner um, and a bunch of other cross-country ski races around the uh, Minnesota region. Um, and I've been on a, a bike team as well, mountain biking um, and cyclocross. Um, and I was uh, pretty active with all of that from like probably 2009. Um, and then I was diagnosed with LQTS in 2020. So I would do like, you know, long bike rides, um, endurance races and, and all that. Um, and now I do more of like uh, commuting um, and just like uh, different variations of what I used to do. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Would anybody else like to jump in and share their experience with sports and exercise out of the panelists? Oh, and Suzanne, I'll, yeah. I'll go and just tell Kian's history. Um, Kian was very, very active when he was young in sports, up until he was diagnosed, he played flag like football, he played upwards basketball, um, he played little league baseball. He was actually in athletics when he was in seventh grade. He tried out for basketball. So he played a lot of sports um, and he really never had anything happen to him until he, about when he was 11, he had um, an episode, he passed out when he was playing basketball. That was our first indicator that he had Something wasn't right, even though he didn't know at the time. But um, luckily, it wasn't anything worse than that. But he was very, very active until his diagnosis. And now he's obviously not as active, but trying to be. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Jason and Mark, would you like to answer? Yeah, thanks. Jason. Yeah, I actually just picked up a pair of cross country skis for the first time, Charlie. So I'm looking forward to getting into it and trying it out a little bit. But um, I grew up playing a lot of rec sports and kind of didn't do anything through college, just some intramurals and stuff. And then in 2011, when our family moved back up to New England, I really was kind of bored and didn't know very many people. So I started the couch to 5k program where I, got really into it and that's when I signed up for my first 5k and then another one and a 10k and before you know it I'm running marathons which I never even thought that was going to happen and since diagnosis in 2020 um, I had a couple of good rounds of VT so I have cut back you know extensively but um, we can get more into that later Okay. All right, Mark, what is your history? We heard um, a little bit earlier before the panel, the, uh, before everyone else jumped on. But let's hear a little more about your history. My history, I, from a young age, I've played a lot of soccer, football, uh, kickboxing and karate and a lot of cross-country running and obviously the general uh, activities at school. Uh, from that, I carried on playing football and golf. Um, I went through a stage where 
I didn't do much exercise at all because of work took over, family life took over. And then obviously I got ill um, and it took a while for to be diagnosed with Gardner syndrome. And it sort of, for the first year, I was a bit sort of worried about doing anything, um, you know, worried about elevating the heart. So um, I started to do swimming in the sea and uh, I've always wanted to complete a dream to do an Ironman as a kid. So uh, I started training and uh, I've now done six half Ironman events, including one world championship, um, two Olympic distance Ironman, or triathlons, a full Ironman, and hopefully this year now another free Ironman, including the world championship in New Zealand. So I train currently off season about eight to 11 hours a week. And sort of when I'm sort of coming close to a race or six weeks out from a race or so up to 20 hours a week training um, and that's swimming, uh, bike, running and uh, strength and conditioning. So that's what I currently do. That's incredible. You guys have quite a history, all of you. And yeah, we can't wait to hear more about your journey. So Okay, who wants to join or uh, talk first? I guess we'll just go back in the order if that's okay, Charlie. What's been the biggest struggle with exercise and sports? Um, I think it's just readjusting like my mindset. I mean, before I was diagnosed, I wasn't like the fastest person. I wasn't like winning races, but I would be fairly competitive with the people on my team and like the people I would train with. Um, and now that I'm on Natalol for the prolonged QT, my max heart rate is probably like 130. And I used to train with a heart rate monitor. So it's just readjusting to, to what I'm capable of because there's a cap on physically what I can do. So it's just a shift in enjoyment. It's more about participating and um, just being grateful to be able to do the things I used to do. And also shifting the distances. I used to do like longer endurance events that could take you know up to eight hours uh, six hours and now I just do like two or three hour events and just make it fun um, and the people that I used to train with they'll just ride with me if they want to do a really slow day um, so it's just accepting limitations and then learning how to be grateful and enjoy what I still can do I love that thank you and I know um, almost everybody here, part of the, being a patient with SADS, we, most of us are all on some type of medication or medications. And I think very, yeah, most of us can relate to that of the effects from beta blockers and other meds that others may be taking. So yeah, that's, it's so true. Thank you. Oh, one more thing before I forget. I do yeah. miss the, the adrenaline, like from mountain biking. Oh. Yeah, because that's that's kind of cut from the beta blocker. So the things that used to be really intense are like just not as intense because it blocks the adrenaline. True, that's so true. And that's probably hard to move forward when you're used to something being one way and then having it completely modified. Okay, Mark. Or let's see, I'm sorry. No, I went to Jason. Let's go to Jason. What's been your biggest struggle? Yeah, I kind of had to pivot away from running really hard. Um, distance running with ARVC is obviously not really recommended by anyone still. So I've really pivoted down to like more hiking, um, started getting into sailing and really just taking it slower and everything, which is when you're used to going out for like a 20 mile run and now I get really excited if I get four or five miles consecutive miles of hiking and it's a big shift mentally um I used to go up into the mountains in the white mountains in New Hampshire and uh do the presidential traverse or go hike up a couple of them in on a Saturday afternoon and that's not happening anymore. If I get up one of the shorter ones now with a couple of friends and my eight-year-old, then I'm doing pretty good. But it is still really slow, and that is so hard to get used to. I'm sure just about everyone with the beta blocker, same. 
it just really takes a lot out of you. It really slows your heart down and makes it really difficult to do just about anything. Yeah, thank you, Jason. All right. Um, and then did we go, sorry, I already lost our order. Did we go to Suzanne next for Kian? Have you noticed what his biggest struggle has been with exercise and sports? Yeah, <clears throat> we talked about that because his physician, his doctor, they really tell him he can't come, he can't really be competitive in sports. And so even though he's super competitive because he is, um, and he, he, he really didn't keep up a lot anyway with a lot of his peers. He just, and he loves sports, but he's not the most coordinated, <laughs> but he still would try out for everything. He tried out for basketball. He's home, mom, I'm going to try out for every sport that I can. I was like, okay, okay. So when they basically told him he couldn't compete, like really try out and be competitive, it really was hard for him, even though he was only 13. And it was really hard because he never really felt like he had symptoms. Like, I don't know if it's because he's always had how he's had it he would be like my, my heart doesn't hurt I don't know why like he didn't understand why he couldn't do because his heart never hurt you know and they would always even ask him during treadmill do you feel anything can you feel that and he was like no no I feel fine um so I think it's that mindset of that he could not try out anymore at school so that was hard and his endurance like they said is is not as good like even when he does treadmill I mean his resting heart rate is like in the low 40s on that law I mean it's low I mean when he gets his heart rate on the treadmill it's up to like 110 I mean it's 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 pushing it for him to get it way up there it's very hard he's very tired so I think that's that's been hard but you know he tries to still stay active and do things outside even though he can't really compete but I think it's more of a mental thing for him too knowing that he can't that he can't try out. He goes and watches all, all the basketball games at school when he watches all the sports, all his friends and stuff do that, knowing he can't do it. So I think that's his main struggle. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Well, thank you. All right, Mark, do you have anything you would like to share about this? I'm, I'm listening to that. I'm, I'm actually very fortunate. Um, I'm not on any meds whatsoever. Um, it's very rare. Uh, to have a defib and have regardless of syndrome without being on meds. So I'm, I'm extremely lucky and grateful. Um, and so I'm, I'm able to sort of train slightly different. Now I, I do monitor my heart rate very, very closely and I train in, in heart zones um, just to make sure. And I would say 90% of all my training would be in zone one uh, because, you know, it's better for endurance. Um, you know, I think one of the big things for me is knowing when to push and when to pull back and learning that and understanding how my body feels as well as monitoring that. Um, I record every session um, all the way through data as well as how I feel my energy levels. Um, you know, nutrition has, has played a huge part in the energy um, and not over energizing sort of too much energy uh, and just keeping a nice balance. You know, I have a rule sort of 10% less is better than 1% too much, um, especially in training, because obviously you step over to sort of certain lines. And the way I look at it, I'm at an age now where I'm not trying to get into the, the 18 or to be in the top 10. I'm doing it to, you know, to enjoy it, um, to help others. And so I can, do intervals and pull them back and sort of do long endurance runs, um, you know, but I've, I've got my limits and my limits I know, and I try and keep underneath them all the time. So I'm, I'm fortunate that way. So, you know, um, it, it works for me. Thank you. Okay. That kind of leads to, the next question and anyone can jump in out of the panelists. We kind of just, we just talked about this, but if you are on medications or beta blockers, what are the main effects that you notice? And if we think we've covered it all by your last question, great. We can move on to the next one. Yeah, I would say uh, just the intensity too. Um, like being able to spike your heart rate and like get up a hill. Hills are just a lot more difficult um, or just anything that requires like a heart rate over 130. So just, I don't know everyone else's experience, but I feel 
like you just hit a plateau and then it just kind of like sucks the energy out of you. Um, so that that's a big thing is like uh, when you need to do like hills or like extra effort. Um, and then also, I mean, this might be a different topic, like making sure, um, I guess that's different, like with like nutrition and hydration, but um, mostly it's the intensity is just not there when I need it. Yeah, I think it's I think it's the same. I mean, the endurance definitely you can tell even with Ken that his his endurance is not, you know, as good as it could be. He gets he gets a lot tired. He always says he doesn't feel any different, but he does get tired. He doesn't he falls asleep pretty I mean, he has a hard time staying awake past like nine o'clock and things like that too. I think the beta blocker kind of really affects him that way. Um he'll say he doesn't bother him or he's not tired, but he yawns a lot. So I think it does affect <laughs> even I think he's just used to it so he's like no I'm fine but I mean with the mm -hmm. exercise he does wear out a lot quicker I think you know than that he should because his heart rate it just, just has to work so much harder and I have to remind myself that his heart rate has to get so much higher when it starts at 40 or like you know, it's low you know 39 40 to get up to like when we're walking you know when he's when he's hitting like 90 he's really working it because his heart rate has to get up pretty high so um I think that's his main problem with with being on the beta blocker. He never complains about it though, ever, never. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. What a champ. <laughs> Anything else or do we want to do the next question? Just second what Charlie said, the metoblol for me is the same with hills. It's just, I've got a little hill to get into the park in my backyard and just getting up that's exhausting every time. But once I'm in it, it's all good. I'd rather be out there than anywhere else. Awesome. I like that. I like, I like the good perspective, your, your positivity towards that. That's great. Even though it's hard. Okay. So uh, how have you adapted your exercise and or physical activity after your diagnosis? And anyone can just out of you four can just jump in. So my background is actually as a firefighter. I've been a firefighter since I was like 15. I was an explorer back in Ohio. And it really changes your mindset when you're going places. I'm sure, uh, you know, everybody can agree that has these types of diseases that I, at least for me, I'm always thinking about if something happens right now, what's going to, what are we going to do, whether I'm with somebody or with them, whether I'm not with anybody, you know, I, being a firefighter, I was always the one going in to get those people. Yeah. Like, why would you put yourself in this situation? Now I am doing it myself, trying to be as responsible as possible, obviously, um, I am protected by my device and I've learned what it can do and what it can't do. And some of that was found out the hard way, but you know, a couple summers ago I was in like Bryce Canyon hiking the Navajo trail and off goes search and rescue personnel down the trail to, you know, evac somebody. And it really made me think about, I'm really glad that wasn't me first off. And, yeah. you know, I really, really like Mark's comment, you know, 10% less is way better than 1% too much. Like that's, that's perfect. Like that's a really good, you know, I'm not in a race. So everything's slowed down since diagnosis. That's for sure. Ah. Yeah, I would say, uh... There's a couple main things I do different. Number one is um, I would used to go like training in the world. Um, it was, even if it was like really now, if I'm going to do that, I go with someone and I carry a uh, AED in my backpack. Um, and luckily, my friends have all uh, are all trained for uh, doing AEDs. Um, so that's a big difference is knowing where I'm going and if I can be uh, given help by a friend. Um, and then, yeah, just making sure I'm 
super hydrated um, and just knowing like what my limits are, not pushing beyond uh, what I think I'm capable of. Since if I, if I go too, too far in the woods or like too long on a ride and I'm not as trained, like I still have to get back mm -hmm. and it's going to take way longer. Thanks, Charlie. Um, I know for, for Kean, he's obviously can't try out for sports really or be competitive, but he still likes to play outside with his friends. They still do like two hand, he said two hand touch football. And he does go on walks with us. I mean, he does more aerobic walking and stuff with us. I mean, not leisure walking, we walk and he likes to do that. Um, he started taking golf lessons and he wants to get more active in golf and things like that. But just like the other people, you know, Charlie and, and Jason have said, you know, he stays hydrated, make sure that he's, he's really good about taking his meds. You know, we do have an AED if he's going to be more active. You know, we always make sure we have it with us. He's always knows he has to tell people that he's with, they know that he has what he, you know, it's about his heart condition. So people are aware and he just monitors his heart. You know, he has, you know, with his Fitbit or his Apple watch and just kind of watches how he, you know, how he feels and how his heart rate and everything is. So he still tries to be active, but just, you know, just in a safer way, just in a different way than he was before. Suzanne. So with myself, um, from when I was diagnosed, um, it took me quite a while um, in order to sort of get my mind set in order to start training to do, you know, anything than a brisk walk, because that's really what you're told. You can't do anything else than a brisk walk. Um, when I had my ICD installed, I was told not to move your arm very little sort of minimum um, for the first 12 months to let it bed in and to be, you know, stronger. I think once I got through that period and sort of, and in my mind, sort of, I started sort of branching out into the sea, um, I felt better. And, uh, you know, I started developing, obviously, I started recording all my data and to help me exercise and step um, and go further. And from that, you know, I've been able to achieve, um, you know, sort of areas in sports, which it was only a dream, um, you know, to do an Ironman and so forth, and even to train. But one of the, the areas for me, you know, when I was diagnosed and so forth, I had, I, you know, I, I purchased external defibs. And I've got one in every car at home. I've got one in all the houses and uh, in all the locations I work in around the UK and Ireland, all have defibs. And uh, we sort of invested in getting so many people trained um, in order to make sure and understand that just in, you know, because someone's got a defib doesn't mean to say you don't take the defib off the wall. Um, you know, you use it. Uh, one can talk to the other and so forth. Um, making sure when I train, I, you know, I always try to train with someone um, and it's always safer. Um, and only 12 months ago, I got hit by a car um, on a bike. So that was two weeks before I'd done Utah World Ironman. Um, and I still, with a broken cheek and a chipped leg and a chipped arm, I still went over to Utah and, and completed the World you know, Ironman in Utah, uh, which is a, an achievement. But it, I'm still monitoring. And, you know, I'm still doing it within um, controlled, you know, sort of environments. But uh, it's... It's as long as you take step by step and not rush into these and you can control the sort of uncontrollables or the controllables, as we say. Thank you so much, Mark. You've been through a lot. Um, okay. What type of tracking device do you use to track your activity? if you do track your activity. Well, I'll jump in first, just because Ken is in the Canadian study. He's on a Canadian study right now for the activity study for, um, for CPVT. It's a, it's a CPVT study. Um, so he wears a Fitbit 
for a year. He sleeps in it. He showers in it. He wears it all the time. And we have to do surveys and things like that. So he does wear the Fitbit. Um, prior to wearing the Fitbit, he wore his Apple Watch all the time to try to track his activity and his heart rate and things like that. But so that's what he that's what he uses. He likes the Fitbit much better, I think. Cool. I use a Garmin uh, Phoenix Six watch and a Garmin uh, strap uh, around the chest. I've also when I've had um, ECGs and also um, stress tests, I've actually worn my watch and my strap to see if I could compare, you know, well, was I getting the right and accurate readings, the same as their equipment. And it's pretty much on par. Um, so it gives you a bit more confidence. It's given me confidence. Um, as I said earlier, I, I log all my training and I make notes on every session I do. I'm quite consistent on doing the same sessions constantly because it's an easy way to track and it helps. And again, I track my sleep. Um, I don't wear a watch to bed. I sort of track it to see if how I slept, my energy levels, and again, my food, my diet. Um, I'm not strict on diet, but I'm sort of, I watch what I eat and when I eat and eat regular. And that that all helps about how I monitor as well as with the watch and so forth, all my training and what I do. And if a training or if I'm feeling sort of the energy is down one week for, or if it's going up another, I try and do it in blocks of four over a four week period. And that's sort of, you can understand sort of even after a race or before a race on how you're feeling. And if you're able to push a little bit or you need to pull back, you know, there's little symptoms where I sort of tune into when I'm doing certain areas. So it just gives you a bit of comfort. I don't swear by the sort of devices all the time because you still have to learn to feel your own body in the sense of how your heart feels, yeah. just in case your watch fails and so forth, if you're on a run or, or so forth. So it's very important to, to get an insight sort of, or a feel for your body in the sense of how you're feeling. Definitely. I'm with Mark. I have my Garmin on all the time and I used to use it very close to how Mark does for training when I was running marathons and, you know, down to, you know, the resting heart rate weeks on end, you know, checking to see where it's at in comparison. And I still wear it to track all my physical activity. Um, I, I don't know if it's just like a, something that's kind of happened and stuck with me, but I'm with Mark in that I've been in the hospital wearing it, watching the monitor, watching the watch and, you know, <laughs> checking the heart rate, comparing it back and forth. And um, I don't know. I was curious if Mark uploaded or uh, does any of his work on uh, Strava as well. No, uh, I, I sort of, I put on mine on an Excel uh, platform. So okay. um, I just keep it on that. I, I don't do anything on Strava. I do okay. Swift bike. Gotcha. Um, my name is Mohammed, uh, and uh, I've just been listening in and incredible stories. Uh, I actually had uh, three back-to-back -back Widowmaker heart attacks and Somehow God uh, decided I should keep living so I continue to live, but I'm a marathon runner. Um, and this all happened because I decided to run um, a thousand days for a thousand children. And on day 600, my, um, my heart and arteries gave up. Um, now I continue since then to monitor my runs uh, through my Garmin watch, my Garmin strap, and it's been amazing. Um, Mark, I, I, what was it, Jason? I think, Jason, you said you were a firefighter. Um, I, I'm a former lifeguard, and I used to always attend to emergencies. So, you know, the fact that now I worry if someone is able to attend to me and just changing that mindset of, well, I used to be the rescuer. Um, doesn't someone know how to rescue me? Um, that's always on my mind. So when you said that, that hit a few chords. Um, you know, it, it, it definitely hit, hit deep, actually. Um, now, one of the things that I am quite fearful of, and I don't know if anyone else is fearful of this, is it's been a year and a half, to, you know, since my, my heart attacks. Um, but I always wonder, like, 
do I, you know, when will my last step be? And I have this fear of if I push my heart rate above a certain zone, will that collapse, you know, the work they did in the hospital? Well, you know, will that collapse some of the stints that I have? Um, so I always, I'm always running in fear. Um, but, and I try to push that away by putting music on. Um, my Garmin strap is almost like a Bible because I'm, it, it, it keeps me on track with my heart rate. And I feel like if I didn't have that, I'd be completely lost. But I, I fear pushing myself. I really do. And then I wonder, well, should I be running with my ID? Should I be running with my nitro? And there are days I do and days I don't. And, you know, I, I don't know if other people go through that same mindset and thinking. Um, I love Jason. You said, uh, you know, having an, uh, I think it was Jason, you talked about having uh, uh, a uh, AED uh, around, you know, maybe that's something I need to do. Um, it's it's, it's eye opening that you do that. Yeah. Thanks, Mohammed. Uh, yeah, we definitely can get more perspective from our panelists. Um, I, we just have a couple more questions and then we will open up. Uh, I will read the chat questions that are available and we'll get through as many as possible. And Mohammed, if you have any questions for anyone at the end, um, we can give you, we can help you with that as well. Okay. All right. How have you worked with your doctors who find a way to exercise safely? Charlie, you want to jump in first? Yes, I uh, I went to the Mayo Clinic um, and they did all the battery of, of tests. Um, and pretty much I've been cleared to do most everything that I used to do um, with an AED, staying hydrated taking my Natalol, um, with the exception of swimming in really cold water. Mm -hmm. Um, and I used to, uh, like I grew up in Duluth, so I used to swim in Lake Superior even recently, luckily without any incidents. Um, so I don't do that anymore unless I'm with people and like wearing a life jacket and I have an AED. Um, but overall it's staying hydrated. Um, and you know, just no restrictions. Um, I used to wear all the heart rate stuff, but I got kind of stuck on that when I was exercising. Um, and just part of my mindset switching is I stopped using it and I just go by like how I feel my perceived effort level. Um, so that's a little bit different instead of tracking data. Cause it's all so skewed now. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's just, being aware of exercise, being cautious, but not like super fearful, and then not doing things that are overly risky for no reason. Yeah, definitely. Being aware is like, is one of the biggest tools that we can have. Just be aware and knowledge, knowledge is power. Uh, Suzanne. Would you like to answer that question, how you have worked with Kian's doctor to help him find a way to exercise safely? Sure. Um, I feel like Kian's is kind of a work in pro progress still since he is still young and growing and all that kind of things. Um, it kind of, since they're pretty restrictive with him, it, it kind of for him, it's more when he has a stress test, when we do his, he has a biennial visits where he does stress tests and, and Holter monitors and things like that. It's just kind of seeing where his, where his heart is and what his results are. Sometimes he still has arrhythmias at different times, not when he's exercising, but when he's actually coming down from exercise. So, so he's, he's kind of got a little different symptoms sometimes than some people. So that's kind of um, hard because you think, well, it's supposed to be when you're being competitive and now you're having these arrhythmias and your heart rate's coming down in the rest, you know, in the lower zones. So his doctors talked about getting him a link monitor that he's, um, you know, put it implanted into him so he can monitor his heart more on a steady basis. And we're actually, he has an, he has an appointment in March and we're going to talk to her more about that. If, you know, he would, she would feel better about him having that. So we could let him be more active 
So I, I just feel like it's a work in progress. I mean, every time we go, we have more questions and it, it, they never want to come out and say what he really can do or what he can't do. It's always, you know, really vague and well, you know, it's, so we just like, like everyone has said, you just kind of, we kind of monitor how he feels. We monitor his heart rate and we have an AED, you know, like I said, we have the AED and we just try to keep him hydrated and make sure he's taking off his medicine, which he's really good about that. So, you know, I just feel like it's always going to be, I don't want to say a struggle, but it's always going to be changing. I feel like sometimes until maybe he gets to a full adult age. Um, Cause I said, they said, they said hormones play a result and things like that. And he's 17, you know, from 13 to 17, he's changed a lot. So that's just kind of where he is. I don't know if anyone has any experience with that. You know, what does it change? You know, did you, was it different when you were younger versus now that you're older and you, you know, been diagnosed longer or anything like that? So I've only been diagnosed for like three, four years now. And I know that it seems to me like my ARVC goes through like phases Thank and you. you know, the phases are like right now I'm in a really uh, benign phase is like dormant, you know, I'm not experiencing any regular symptoms of any sort. Um, and my doctor and I work really closely. I see him every six months. Uh, we have really candid conversations. Um, I say, I'm going to get into sailing. He says, that's a great thing to get into. Just, you know, be aware of this type of sailing or, you know, it's probably not a great idea to do this while you're out there, you know, stuff like that. We talk about, um, we have really, really good conversations, but you know, he's paying attention to everything. I do have an ICD, so I'm protected internally. And um, a lot of the places where I go, I am making sure that there's a AED hanging on the wall as well. So I'm really paying attention to that stuff. Um, and he encourages that sort of thing. And he really stresses, and I, we've talked about it here before, and I'm sure we will more, that everyone just really needs to listen to their own body and like really get in tune with it. Cause it's really easy, especially in competitive sports to ignore symptoms. And that's not something that people with these types of diseases can really do. I think we lost our people. Yeah, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. It looks like oh, no. Sia's phone dropped up, but she's rejoining. Oh, okay. So, um, we'll give her just a second. And if she's not able to join, then um, I can take over for her again. Um, is there anybody else who uh, would like to answer the question about um, how you've worked with your doctor to find ways to exercise safely? Yes. Um, I think before I actually went to my doctor to, you know, to start training, um, it's basically, it was my family, my wife, um, really, uh, before I went anywhere, that uh, I had the support of herself and my girls. Uh, before I went anywhere because obviously they were there uh, when I was sort of in the bed and it's always easier when you're in the bed than out of the bed as I've experienced having my daughter who's also got Brigada uh, since the age of eight uh, she's now 18 um, I had my first heart attack at 13 um, and the second at 14 I've had over 20 um, heart attacks cardiac arrests I'm now 50 um, and, um, or shy of just 50. Um, 
so for me to approach the doctor um, I needed to do my homework to make sure um, you know what I was going to present uh, was you know he was going to be serious and look look at it and sort of not laugh uh, in many ways but uh, when I did approach him um, he basically he said to me to, to get up and stand in front of the mirror and talk to the mirror uh, because you know it, it wasn't a done thing um, you know no one had ever sort of even attempted to do what I wanted to do um, and you know for having so many attacks and being quite active on on Brigada um, it was a no and it was a, a quite blunt no um, until sort of I went away and done a bit more work um, you know I brought on a coach to advise me they would only go so far um, obviously I, I interviewed many coaches and none of them were really too concerned about my condition. So I didn't go with them. And until I you know, found this particular coach who was very supportive, advice, wouldn't engage in a training aspect until um, he got permission and I got permission really from my cardiologist to move forward. Um, I engaged with a nutritionist to help me to see, can I put the plan together? And I did put a plan together. I went back to my cardiologist um, with a lot of work and sort of thinking smart, um, you know, just convince about instead of doing a brisk walk, um, I did further testing and passed all tests. Um, even though it was taking longer for him to say no, he still said no. Um, and I think it was the, the fire inside me, which I wasn't set. I wasn't settling for no. Um, so my last result was, was going to Pedro, uh, Professor Pedro uh, Bugada. Um, I met him once in Dublin, extremely, well, a gentleman, um, you know, um, and I wrote a letter to him uh, asking for his support and what do I need to do? Um, in fairness to him, he came back, um, you know, advising on certain tests, going back to my cardiologist. And if the test went well, um, he was giving me the green light and, and supporting me. Um, and as Jason said, you know, I've got an ICD and he said at the end of the day, there's people running marathons and so forth without and haven't got, you know, they haven't got that security uh, where I have. Um, and, you know, he said, it, it, it's not as though you've not had a heart attack before you've had one. So you know what to expect. So I had that in mind. My wife thought I was crazy, uh, but uh, I still had her support. And obviously I turned the doctor around in the sense of supporting me. Um, and since then, he supported me 110% all the way through, monitoring everything I do um, and understanding. And, you know, I use a platform called Exhale and I share that with him. Um, I go through details about what I'm looking at doing and so forth. And that helps him with a peace of mind that what I'm doing, I'm taking and trying to control all the controllables in all my approach. Um, it's got to a stage now um, that there could be underlying conditions, what they can't see due to the fact that the sports I'm doing. So I'm now looking at going over to Belgium to see Professor uh, Brigada to do, carry out some studies to see if there's anything else what's been missed. But uh, I now have great support um, throughout and uh, it's actually, it's a comfort, a huge comfort all the way through. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. Is there anything else that um, any of you panelists would like to add to that? I just want to um, say one thing. I just want to say one quick thing. Kian does wear a medical art bracelet too when he's out. I mean, he wears it all the time to school and um home and we're out because you know I always tell them if we're in the car and we get in a car accident or something happens and you know medical personnel need to know that he has CBVT and that he's on certain medications and things like that because there's certain things he shouldn't they should be aware of yeah. and um and for him since he is young obviously the school knows the nurse knows I have to fill out information for the nurse and they know and his teachers know about his condition and everything like that as well because they have AEDs at school so just wanted to add that real quick yeah, I like that. That's yeah, it's very good to be aware and make others around you aware 
And if you're in a situation where you're in an accident, that's, yeah, that's great to be prepared. Okay. Well, thank you panelists so much for answering those questions. Uh, it looks like we have a few questions from our awesome viewers. The first question uh, is, it says, my son is 15 and was diagnosed with CPBT last October. It was found when we weren't even looking for it. He's never had a cardiac arrest and is now stable on natalol and flecainide and is back to playing lacrosse and working out six days a week with his EP, with his EP's blessing. My question is, how do I make him understand the risk without instilling a ton of fear into him? He thinks he is fine and I want him to realize the severity and make sure he is listening to his body and staying compliant with medication. Uh, well, it's really hard. <laughs> uh, I know where you're coming from because I'm, you know, I'm the mom. And when Keon was, my son was diagnosed at 13 and I was terrified. I remember asking his doctor when he was not in the room if he was going to drop dead. I mean, was he just going to die? Because I, I mean, it was such a shock because his first doctor was like, he's got to stop. I and mean, his treadmill was so bad. And, um, and like I said, he was all, he always said, my heart doesn't hurt. Like he didn't understand either. His heart didn't hurt. He never felt symptoms. He said, he, you know, he really, I mean, I did instill a little fear in him only because I had to, because <laughs> I'm his mom and I, I had to make him understand that, you know, cause he'll, he'll, he'll get upset now about things and get really emotional and get, he's never had cardiac arrest either, but he has passed out a couple of times before he was medicated. He's never had anything. Luckily, thank God. Since he's been medicated, he's very compliant, um, but he is not as act competitive as it sounds like your son is. His doctors won't tell him he can't, he really can't be. I don't know if your son has passed out or anything like that. And he does take natalol and like, and I have pretty high doses of both. Um, but you just, I mean, I just look at him sometimes and I say, you know, you, when, especially when he gets really mad or he gets really emotional, I'm like, you have to calm down. You have. I know you don't feel like this, but you're the only one that can take care of you. And everyone around you is not going to know that you have a heart condition. And you have to understand that there's certain things you can't do, that you could have an event, a pretty serious event, if you don't do these things. I mean, sometimes you have to scare them a little bit, not too, you want them to be able to be active, but you have to really just instill the fact that they, it is serious, whether they can tell or not, that it can happen anytime. And they just have to make sure they take their meds. Like, and all the other panelists said, listen to their body. Don't push it too hard and just really, you know, do that. I feel for you. I'm right there. Believe me, when you don't have control over it it's because it's your kid, I'm, I want to send him to church camp because his brother wants to go when I'm terrified about sending him and trusting someone else to make sure that he takes his medication. But I don't want to keep him from going because I know he wants to do those things. And I know one day he'll be out in the world. So it's just a really hard lesson in life to try to do, especially when they're young. I hope that was helpful. I'm here if you ever want to talk. I'm sure you can get my information through SADS. Mm -hmm. We've been going through it for about four years. So, man, Ken's really open about talking about it and everything. Thank you, Suzanne. I'm so glad you were able to answer that question. And I know as a mother uh, myself with children with long QT, it's, it's hard because you don't want to label your children or have them red flagged and you want them to be as normal as possible along the lines of being safe as possible. So it, it definitely gets tricky. So thank you for sharing that. Okay, here is the next question. Um, I think it's um, Dania, 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 Dania Kellis. Hi all. I am the research coordinator for the physical activity research study that Suzanne mentioned. Oh, awesome. Thank you for joining. Happy to connect with anyone diagnosed with CPVT. If you are interested in participating in any of our research initiatives, I work with Dr. Shu Sanitan. San Guys, I am not, not doing well with the names right now. Uh, Sanit Sanitani? 
<laughs> in Vancouver, Canada, and she has her email listed. Um, and we can uh, get this to anyone that is interested in needing to um, ask more about this research. Thank you so much for adding that. Sorry, I didn't probably didn't say your name right. <laughs> okay, does anyone else have any other questions? Okay. I just got a notification that there is another one. Let me pull it up. I'm so sorry, everyone, that I had to change to my phone. Technology has failed me tonight. <laughs> All right, let me pull that next question up. Let's see, can one of my sad friends, one of my committee members, um, add that question for me onto the document and I will read it to everyone. Let's see. Um, it, it, it looks like the question was there in our chat and I was trying to move it over so you could see it Tia, but the question is gone now. Um, okay, well, I found it. You did, oh, okay, great. Okay. Sorry, okay. So this is from Jenny Shroom. My experience with my Apple Watch is that it is very, a very unreliable heart rate monitor. As soon as I sweat, it loses accuracy. As soon as I start having PVCs, it stops registering a heart rate. As soon as I slip into VTAC, it also loses the ability to track my heart rate. My interrogations are so delayed and the only only give me information about events of a certain severity and duration, which is a very limited way to gain information about my exercise is what, what is okay and what is too much. Has anyone found a way to get more comprehensive inter, why am I saying that word wrong? Inter, how do you guys say that? Interrogation information. Does anybody want to start? Yeah, sorry. Do you does anyone want to answer that? Any of our panelists? My device interrogations don't give me all the information I want as well. Um, it's just the way the device is set up. Um, I don't believe, I think the last time I went in for an interrogation, my device is program to not really recognize anything below I believe it's 140 and that's a setting that my EP put on my particular device um, so I could be in a slow VTAC which has happened where the device doesn't record and doesn't respond so it's really frustrating to see it and to have it but my doctor says that, you know, you're young and your heart is actually a very healthy working heart and it doesn't need to respond. Your body will reset it like it has in the past or you'll recognize what he's trying to prevent is unnecessary shocks. So I think that uh, that's really your device specific um, and I don't think that there's any Apple watches or uh, really good tech yet that you wear that is finding good PVCs and good VTAC sensing that I've seen. Um, I know that they say that they're capable, but I don't believe that that's always um, really foolproof yet, as far as I know, but somebody can correct me on that. Okay, thank you so much for answering that, giving your advice. Okay, we're gonna do one last question. Jason, this is for you as well. 
after your diagnosis with ARVC, did your doctors restrict any and all weightlifting? And also, when testing, did any abnormal did any abnormalities show up on your MRI at first? Yeah, so I actually meet like all the task force criteria for ARVC and one of those special cases. Um, my MRI showed it right away. Uh, the only guidelines, I wasn't a big weightlifter before, so I should preface with that. Um, the only guidelines I really received on that was in regards to the device itself. I have a dual lead Medtronic. And with the dual leads, you have to be careful of um, damaging the leads initially because of the way they're attached to the heart muscle. So um, repetitive exercises uh, that really stretch that area out, you want to be really careful with. Three years in now, I'm starting to get a little bit more into like a weight training uh, regimen. And I'm definitely a lot more confident uh, in the device itself. So I'm still careful and cautious about it. Um, I haven't gotten into weights yet. I'm still doing uh, pull-ups, push-ups, and that sort of thing. Uh, lots of plank. But um, I'm hoping after watching Dr. Ackerman's uh, presentation a couple weeks ago, he said that pretty much everyone with SADS is pretty much good for weightlifting. Next appointment with my EP, I will follow up with that and see what he thinks. But I think that that's a good uh, transition to make that's not super high cardio that might be good for myself at least. Thank you again for sharing. Uh, Charlie, Jay, Suzanne, Mark, I wanna thank you again so much for taking your time to be part of this webinar. We are so grateful and to everyone that joined us tonight, and I want to remind you that if you signed up for this, the recording will be available. And a quick reminder about our movement challenge to check your email, check our blog, and sign up for that. I appreciate everyone's time and have a good night to everyone. Thank you.